Palmetto State Armory, knowing that we're suckers for all things GWAT and FDE, have rather uniquely brought to market their take on the XM110 with their Sabre 10 line of rifles. Though our Super SAS is far from the clone correct replica of the Knights and Eugene Stoner collab of ages, they have that as well, this appears to be a pretty interesting and cost effective DMR setup. In this overview, we'll see how the PSA Super SAS performs while keeping in mind its original intent and design for the XM110 program. Given the significant cost difference between the two, is this a cope or is this a viable budget-friendly system for the civilian market? This video is sponsored by the Mark 15 Hydra. The Mark 15 is the most versatile black rifle platform the industry has ever seen. The most you will ever need to convert calibers is barrel, bolt, and a magwell. The changing is quick and easy, and the combinations are practically limitless. With just one serialized lower, you can have any configuration you can imagine. And by TNVC, check out the new Mars LC 2000 meter laser range finder. It's compact and loaded with features, including a built-in ballistic computer, Bluetooth, a red aiming laser, as well as an IR ranging laser, which cannot be detected by most night vision devices. Check out TNVC.com for all the details. The AR-10 was initially snubbed in lieu of the M14 and was wildly overlooked while American forces slogged through proxy wars and actual wars, learning more and more the need and importance for having a weapon system and operators that were capable of denying ground to their opposition as we moved more and more towards urban combat scenarios. Post-1990, the SR-25 became the jewel of special forces and cut its teeth in Iraq and Afghanistan, proving the need for a full rifle caliber system at the squad level. Requirements were thus issued and the Semi-Automatic Sniper System, or SAS, given the military's designation XM-110, was born. This platform was typically paired with the 3.5 by 10 power Leupold Mark IV and allowed the designated marksmen more precise engagement capabilities up to 800 meters and did so more quickly than the previously issued M24 bolt action. Though being double the weight of the M16 at the time, the capabilities afforded by the 7.62x51 cartridge were worth the burden for barrier penetration and inclement conditions at range, while ergos kept it wieldy in tight spaces in intermediate engagements. This flexibility changed how the role of designated marksman was applied and later spurred on more of an emphasis on range and penetration as seen in the more recent XM7 program. So with all that in mind, what is the PSA Super SAS? Well, it's not quite an M110, and to be frank, the feature set resembles a cross between the M110 and the XM7, minus being chambered in the new spicy cartridge. Our Super SAS came equipped with a Faxon 1 in 10 twist 20 inch match grade barrel, chambered in 308, utilizing a rifle length gas system that is adjustable. The barrel wears a 5 8 by 24 three prong open tine flash hider for a hat, these are generally exceptional at reducing muzzle flash that comes from these bigger bore systems. The heart of the system is a big old hard chrome finish BCG utilizing Sprinko springs and gas rings, as well as OCK gas key fasteners. The trigger is a PSA Sabre DLC coated two stage trigger, which pulled at two and a half pounds. This was a crisp, decent step up from an enhanced trigger, but not quite as clean as a Geisley. You'd have to spend about that kind of coin to get better than this. Although this is a great choice for a precision long range system like this. The Radian ambidextrous safety and bolt release are a welcome feature and appreciated when having to shoot in a prone or compressed slash compromised position. Choosing the Radian LT charging handle was also a good consideration, especially when the scope and the wall folder can get a bit crowded around the charging handle area. Having extra real estate makes it easier for indexing and manipulation of the bolt. It does come with a B5 pistol grip and B5 CPS long buttstock. The stock comes at a hefty 23 ounces, but is a really easy to use comb height adjustability and length of pull adjustability. It also comes equipped with a 15 inch Sabre lockup handguard that has pick rail all along the 12 o'clock position, M lock everywhere else, and four QD spots to accommodate a sling. As far as extra goodies go, PSA includes with our version of the Super SAS, three stainless steel 20 round Duramags, as well as a nice 46 inch double rifle savior bag. 
The mags worked great, despite GD's insistence that it wouldn't, and we also tested a 10-round P-mag in ours and experienced no magazine-related malfunctions. So was the Super SAS actually super? We took it to the range to find out. We're out at the outdoor range here. Shout out to Mr. Guns. We're gonna be doing a quick cold bore accuracy test with this. We switched to the five to 25 and we'll be shooting off of bags to take me as much out of the equation as possible. We'll be testing this with 175 grain Winchester match ammunition. Five rounds from a bipod in a bag off of a plastic table. Not bad. For reference, 10 shot group. This one was for sure me, but even with it included, probably easily two MOA. Ow, you hit me right in the face. <laughs> I was not loaded up on that at all. I probably threw about at least two of those, but uh, I felt pretty good about most of these trigger pulls. This is inside the size of my hand and probably maybe like four and a half MOA at 100 yards with wind. The M80 ball was around four to five MOA at 100 yards. We were still able to connect easily during our hard use day in the rain with poor visibility out to 400 yards. And it was plenty accurate for shots inside of 100 yards with our offset red dot. Shout out to Rotopoint and Trijicon. As long as we could see the dot and heft up the rifle, it rang steel with ease. With match grade ammunition, this is where this rifle got interesting. We were able to consistently get about one and a half MOA at 100 yards. Are there more accurate rifles? Sure, but that's pretty ridiculous performance coming out of a gun that's one third cheaper than most of its competitors and a fifth of the cost of a Knight's. It also maintained this level of accuracy right after mag dumps. With hand loads and a decent shooter, you could probably tighten this up to about one to 1.2 MOA. As for reliability, the gun handled both typical bench rest shooting as well as some adverse condition shooting way better than most AR-10s in its price range. The adjustable gas was not changed from the factory setting and we shot, let's say some particularly sus ammunition through the gun at times. Only the best for the PSA. Only two things got this rifle to stop working optimally. The first issue we had was with the ejector. After the first 110 rounds through the gun, which was mostly bench shooting, we began to notice a drop in accuracy and shortly after getting multiple failure to eject malfunctions. After a field strip, we confirmed that our ejector plunger had gotten particularly stiff and upon closer inspection of the casings, we noticed smooth marks on the case heads. It turns out that our ejector was shaving small flakes of brass off the case head during the unlocking of the bolt after firing and tucking those shavings behind the ejector, eventually causing it to seize. While doing research, we found this to be a common issue with big bolt ARs and found some solutions ranging from using a chamfered ejector to using a Dremel to taper the edge of your ejector. We elected to send it back to PSA, who fixed it via a less firm ejector spring, completely alleviating the problem. The second issue was caused by intentionally introducing mud into the system. We dropped the rifle, dust cover open, ejection port down into a slurry of Texas clay that made a fine mud. To our surprise, the gun worked fine after the first toss. It performed so well after the first toss that we, and by we I mean my camera guy Bobby, threw it about 20 feet back into the mud again. It again survived the abuse, almost. That is until the mud that was caked onto the optic fell directly into the ejection port and got pushed into the bolt carrier group itself. Oh my gosh, it didn't work good in there. This finally led to multiple failure to feed and failure to eject malfunctions. Just out of battery. I had to actually sit here and mortar it with two hands to actually get the gun out of battery. After we used a bit of water and some go juice, we were able to get it back up and running within a couple of minutes of our rain-filled downtime. This would kill any semi-automatic regardless of manufacturer, so we give it a huge plus for surviving that day at the range. 
This was no worse for wear and still giving great groups despite the now, mistreatment. We are up to a cleaning, a bolt breakdown, and uh, ALG go juice. Let's see if the ALG is the secret. So as promised, if you guys made it this far and are from the forums, we're going to answer your questions specifically. Uh, the first one we're getting from Neil Monk 21 He specifically asked about the B5 furniture, more specifically the stock. I actually like the stock. We didn't use it enough to sit there and say it's better or worse than the PRS stock that comes from Magpul, which is probably the only thing that's close to this. Yeah. But I do think that this was, uh, for being included in the rifle right out of the factory, actually a very good choice. I think it's kind of funny, though, because ours came with the uh, law folder. Yeah. So the the length of pull with the law folder is already kind of like, for at least for us, where it needed to be. Yeah. You can get a pretty fine adjustment. But, I mean, we literally have the comb bottomed out. It's heavy, but so is most PRS stocks. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I, I would be upset if this was on a 5.56 gun, but I think on a 308 gun, it makes sense. I feel like it's negligible on this. Uh, 10 ounces doesn't really matter on a gun this size. Um, they asked specifically for 10 round groups. We, we're pushing towards that on anything. We did 10 round groups on the crank where it was a hope and a prayer anyways. Yeah. Uh, this, I thought it was almost more important. Technically, we were doing like 20 round groups by the end of it uh, because the DMR roll would ask for a higher volume of fire, period. Yeah, uh, this is a slow machine gun. Basically, it's designed to sit there and pop, pop, pop. That's what it's designed to do, right? And still maintain that accuracy over time. It crushed that. If there was something that like actually impressed me about the gun, it was maintaining that performance over time. No, I have I have no real complaints. Even with the M80, we were shooting. I mean, and the reason we shot M80, uh, someone had asked us also in the forum yeah. to try it out. A hundred yards and in, I would say that. It was fine. We were able to make hits with it with the scope. Uh, everything with the red dot that we pretty much were able to see, with which was like 50 to 75 yards, Yeah, we didn't have any issues hitting with M80. Um, really where you started to see it was if you were shooting paper at 100, you were getting 4 to 4.5, 5 MOA groups, and then trying to shoot like out to 5, 600, like you were just kind of dancing, you know? In a pinch, I think M80 would work. It'll cycle M80, and you'll be able to hit a target maybe on a follow-up shot if it's kind of weird because you're cone of fire. Yeah. You start to measure things in cone of fire after 400 yards. And, and to be fair, like shooting this without like match-grade ammo is like spaghetti without the sauce, in my opinion. Yeah. You want to have something that's going to be accurate. Ain't nobody getting sub-MOA groups <laughs> with ball ammunition yeah. like that. The other thing, too, and it was interesting, we had a lot more than one person Talk about the magazines for this. And, and I've always kind of had a good reputation for Duramags. Uh, we had three, three of which we were not very nice to, and they did fine. These things got dropped in the mud. I mean, they still have, like, dirt and mud in them. I, I think it's really rad that they include three, at least yeah. in this version, and just that these magazines by themselves are typically relatively expensive. The kit itself, the way it's priced isn't bad. Coming with a bag, because you're not going to open carry this into your local range, but coming with three mags, too, I think that's where I think you should start. If you're getting a system like this, you should at least have a couple of mags. I didn't have a problem with them at all, even in the rain. The AR-10 platform as a whole, they were typically issued with things like a 1 to 8. Yeah. Or like a, like a 2 to 10. We originally had one on there, but we're like, well, which was fine. I, I We didn't have any issue with it, especially once we started shooting a little further. It's harder to be precise without that higher end. Which we wanted to try to take away as much variable as possible. Currently, right now, we have the Vortex uh, Viper HD 5 to 25. But we were shooting this, I mean, in the rain. It, it made it for a more fair comparison because, again, you might be a better shooter than us. And you might be able to get this thing to be one MOA. But at least we can know I'm pulling the trigger with a good sight picture and a consistent point of aim. Running a red dot on this was cool, obviously until we got mud in the thing. Yeah. But uh, Rotopoint actually had this really rad uh, little mount that got onto our ADM mount here. Well, they make that and they make the, the hand stop here, which the hand stop's actually pretty that was nice. Pretty nice. I would almost want to have like, like if, it, if not that, some kind of vertical foregrip something for She's shooting off the shoulder. Girl. Yeah, this is a, and we'll, we'll roll in weight here somewhere here. This thing's naked, but the way we have it set up, it's heavier than it is naked. And it's, that is not a light rifle. Yes, you can do push ups, but uh, I think when you're coming from a 5.56 five, gun to this, you, you better eat your Wheaties if you're going to go level it. I was good for about like half a magazine before, I think you said it, like you just start getting sway. Yeah, <laughs> like you have to wait between shots to get no, it to fati settle. Fatigue is a thing. Yeah, the uh, shout out to this just for ambiance. We put this on here, but Blue Force Gear has their little chocolate chip. 
uh, sling. Oh, I think it looks, kind of, it looks pretty good with this. <laughs> this is kind of meant to be here. But my other real big takeaway for this was cost, and, and it managed to survive us being not very friendly to it at all. Um, and minus, what, a two-cent spring that ended up costing us a little bit of reliability early. Once the fix happened, this thing abused and survived. Like, it was a disgusting repair to just sit there and be like, okay, yeah. we just took clay, basically, to the inside of the BCG, just took a water bottle, kind of did that, slapped some lube on there, and immediately it went back to working. This thing's still filthy now, and it would still work now. I think the only thing close to this in price where it gets reasonable is maybe one of the old Smith & Wesson AR-10s uh, or a DD, but those are even those are going to be either from $500 to $1,000 more, and that's before you get into ammunition, bipod, scopes, whatever. Uh, to get appreciably better than this, uh, you're probably going to have to step up to something like a Knight's or a Nevesky or something like crazy expensive. And that's where I think that this thing, and it's this typical PSA fashion, where they kind of crush it being able to either buy volume or that they're selling direct to the consumer. If I'm going to spend AR-10 money on something and actually get proficient with it, it's a good investment. You know, I, I, I understand this being a appealable option to people because it's like, hey, I need to have or I want to have a 308. This is a good place to start. Again, for the price, is pretty ridiculous as far as what it's performing and delivering on the back end if you feed a good ammunition. Uh, the other kind of thing, and, and I know just because we're talking about like a semi-long-range gun, the 6.5 guys are going to come out. They, they do have solutions for you for 6.5 Creedmoor. They even have... Bobby's current dream is that 14.565. <laughs> but I, I do think 308 on the civilian side of things, dude, the FUDs are going to keep you fed, dude. There's 308 in every single grain weight that you could imagine. Just out of, and we actually were talking about this earlier on in the review, where we actually went to our local Walmart just out of curiosity. It's probably the most stocked round <laughs> yeah. that they have. That's also partially why we did a test with M80 was to just see the practical accuracy yeah. of M80. If you got stuck with nothing but M80, it, I mean, it's, it, it's going to work just fine. You just have to have reasonable expectation or expectations at distance. If it's blue helmets coming for us, they're, they're going to have the 7.62 by 51. Uh, if it's going to be traditionally here stuff that needs to get domestically sourced, we have 308 in every single store that sells ammo. And then just from a capability standpoint, like there's this idea around guns pr protecting us from tyranny. This is the best small arm, in my personal opinion, that's easily accessible, relatively affordable, and you can get trained on. That levels the playing field a lot. I was a police officer in a former life, and this would, yeah, absolutely sketch me out. I'd yeah. feel very underarmed if all I had was an AR and he's running around with this 200 yards outside of my physical capability as a rifle. But this is, this is true. You're starting to get into real freedom here. And like I said, from a cost proposition standpoint, it it's crushes. Ex it's accessible. Yeah. This is one of those guns where I'm not trying to sell in a year or two, just because it would be very hard for me to replace this from a capability standpoint. Handguns are a dime a dozen. Those were my thoughts. Uh, if you guys have shot it yourself, uh, let us know. If, if, if you haven't, try it. It's pretty rad. Um, and then if you guys want to really reach out, go check out the forums. It's really a better place to learn. We will have a thread on this specifically. If you want to want to see all the questions we didn't answer, we'll try to answer them there after the fact. And then, or you can follow us on socials. We are at AR15COM on pretty much all of them except for YouTube. We're going to be ARFCOM here because it's lame. Till next time, I'll see you guys later.